going to talk a little bit about my, my career path and also my sort of passion, really, for connecting talent with opportunity. And you'll see as I go through my story, I regarded myself as talent, but it's very difficult connecting to opportunity, given where I came from. And that's one part of the story. The other part that I think is equally as important, perhaps more important at a macro level, is about, it's important as far as I'm concerned that everybody has equal opportunity, equal access to opportunity, so that every young person, be it a millennial or my four-year-old daughter eventually, they have the potential to fulfill their potential and be all they can. And what this really boils down to when you talk about it is social mobility. And the people in this room, you know, you have the, the businesses, the power in many ways to actually change the game for a lot of people. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I don't just talk about things, I actually do stuff. So I'm an entrepreneur and when I look at an issue and potential, the natural instinct is to come up with a solution to it. So I'm going to actually pitch to you something that I've come up with, which I'm working with both Plotter and Sam, who's sitting over there, who's actually the CEO. Something I've come up with, which is potentially part of the solution. Not the only solution, but part of it. So I want you to be kind. And if you want to invest or get involved, we can talk, talk to me later as well. Um, so I'm a, I'm, as I said, I'm an example, really, of talent. If you look back at my career and the successes I've had, um, without blowing my own horn, People had to tell me that. I didn't actually realize that until quite recently. I just got on with it. And I struggled to, to break through. And I've been involved in many, many careers, but the system just didn't work for me. It really was a fight against the machine. But I'm on the sort of, you know, the Maslow scale. I'm self-actuated. So I never took no for an answer. I didn't really care what the barriers were. I went usually around people, over them, under them. But sometimes I just go straight through them. That's just my, the way I am. And I managed to achieve. Not everybody has that innate ability, has that confidence, um, and that sort of bloody mindedness, which I had. So I never really gave up, but my driver has always been, I wanted to be in business. I could tell you the story about my paper round when I was 13, I'm not gonna go through that, but I always wanted to be in business. So when I was young, I said to my people, my parents and my neighbors who had businesses, they were joiners, bricklayers, one guy in the quarry, I said, I want to be in business. No one could really help me. And they said, well, you should be an accountant. So I thought, at the age of 14, being a businessman, I should become an accountant. And no one told me any different. And you'll see, as I go through my story, I didn't really have a clue. I had no vision. I had no path. I was bumbling along. I had to climb onto sort of a, a pedestal, look over the hedge, the next horizon, work my way to the next one, look over the next one. Whereas I meet kids today, who are sort of, you know, 14 years old. I say, well, what are you thinking of doing? They're kind of like, and they tend to go to sort of the nicer schools. And they're kind of saying, well, I'll tell you what, Piers, what I'm thinking of doing is I'm going to do my levels, I'm going to do a degree. I probably need to do a master's to differentiate myself. And I'm probably, I'd like to do an MBA, but I'm not sure yet because it's quite expensive. And he's like 14 years old. I look at him and I'm like, yeah, you're joking. And they have these plans because they've got the social capital, the social networks, the support. It's not always the case. I meet lots of, you know, very intelligent young people that go to very nice schools who haven't got a clue either. It just depends on, it's luck of the draw, really, in terms of that, that social network you tend to have. Now, so I didn't know. So I had fantastic role models in my parents. My dad went to Cambridge, you know, so he, in those days, he was a working class lad from Manchester. You went to Cambridge and you came home again. He didn't get to join the club in many ways. My mum was a nurse, came over in the 60s. And she was always enterprising. She was always the one that set up the local health centre. But in Barbados, where she came from, because of her colour, she could never work in a bank. So she left the country and came here to work. So I fell my 11 plus. Um, I fell quite a few exams, actually. And any of you that have got West Indian parents in the room will know that as well as my downhill mountain bike, and it's a pretty dangerous sport. So I kind of survived getting through my exams. And I realized that doing my O-levels twice, doing some of my A-levels twice, that there came a point where I had to man up. I had to step up and say, you know what, going forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the game for myself. Problem is, with the system we all live in, is that it looks at the past. So it looks at all the stuff that I'd messed up, basically. It wasn't looking at me. Some employers did, which I'll come on to and my view of the future, what I had to do, what I had to get on with. And that's really what was important. So 
found my 11 plus, my CV wasn't great, and I thought, well, what do I do? Uh, I did law at night, so I thought, well, law is quite interesting. I'll tell you what I should do, an accounting and law degree, that makes sense. I had no idea what being a lawyer was, no idea what a solicitor was or a barrister, until I actually got almost into law school. So I went through my degree, I managed to get a decent degree, ended up at law school, had no really idea about what being a lawyer was. And then the beauty was I got some work experience. So I used to work in bars and I'd pin down QCs and solicitors and say, can I have some work experience? They'd be sort of drag them off the stage in my leg. And eventually they, I got work experience. And that really opened my eyes to the potential. It was something that really excited me. And a firm in Manchester actually gave me a job, only one firm. You'll see there's a, a recurring theme in my life. I tend to get one chance. So one firm offered me a job, didn't want to work in Manchester, came to London and wanted to work in the city. So now you're looking at a mixed race kid who fell as 11 plus, who went to a comprehensive school in a mill town in Lancashire, did his O levels twice, his A levels twice, who wants to be a lawyer in the city. It was quite a big ask. <laughs> looking back, at the time, I didn't see it like that. I was just like, that's what I want to do and that's what I'm going to go and do. So I was sort of just bowled on really. So eventually, um, one law firm gave me a chance, and uh, I, applied to 60, I applied 68 times. I always remember that number. And that's quite a lot of work in those days. It was a letter and a CV. Some twice, admittedly, some firms. But I applied 68 times to get my training contract. And also, if I applied 67 times, I might not be standing here today. Some kids, I know, give up at three or four because it's just too much like hard work. I was absolutely determined. And that was my big chance. And then, what then happened was I looked around and thought, I don't want to be a lawyer, I don't, I don't really understand it. That's all I really knew. And a friend of mine that said to me, why don't you try investment banking? You did an accounting and law degree. You should, investment banking, I think you'd like that. And I sort of looked at him and said, what's investment banking? I didn't have a clue. I literally bought a book called, weirdly, Investment Banking, <laughs> read it, started to read this pink newspaper that I'd never read before, just so I could, you know, talk enough about a good game to get through an interview. Um, and I'll tell you a story, so there's an interesting parallel here. So I met this friend of mine, very quick one, at law school, wealthy guy, uh, European, very wealthy family, the right education, the right background, he had a plan, law, investment banking, blah, blah, blah. He'd applied to uh, lots of banks, the big names, Goldman's, Merrill's at the time, uh, Credit Suisse First Boston, now Credit Suisse. I applied too, I thought I did what he will do. He got an offer on the graduate program. So graduate program is three years, then there's a three-year associate program, then you become a vice president and then a director, then an MD. I applied, I get a polite letter saying thank you, but no thank you, to, from all the banks, to be quite frank. He gets on the grad program, second year, results. He's missed that one year of serfdom, being chained to a desk till four in the morning every day. So he thought, we all thought, wow, it's amazing. I applied nothing. Went through a headhunter, actually, through a long, another story I won't bore you with. And he got me an offer from B BZW, Barclays de Zoot, sort of bar cap now. And I arrive at this bank in September 1997. Barclays decided to put it up for sale the next day almost, which was fantastic. I thought last in, first out, blah, blah, blah. But actually, I performed. I'd worked really hard. And they said to me, when they did the acquisition, they couldn't map the roles. So you were either mapped out of the business, which many were. You were mapped down, which many were. Or you were mapped up. So I was mapped up. So three months later, I arrive at Credit Suisse, a second year associate, in a role where I was not on paper capable of being a second year graduate. And I performed and I did well. I made money. A lot of those bankers are still friends. Some of them are actually my shareholders, which says something. Um, so it just shows you that my innate ability, my talent, the system, the CVs, the way it was done, just completely missed it. So that's, that's one example. And then in 2000, the internet boom started. I decided to sort of walk out of the door and go into business. So I started an internet business. Um, I focused on technology and telecoms. And again, no one took me seriously. When I used to walk into rooms, I'd sit down. I was the investor. I was the CEO. I was the founder. I'd sit at a table, and everyone would be sitting there filing the nails, emailing the, the wife, or whatever it might be. And I'd say, are we going to start the meeting? And everyone would go, no, 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 hang on a minute. We're waiting for peers. So no one's, I've turned up to meetings. I've been given, given boxes to deliver. No one expects me to be that person. I call it the double take. I walk in a room, people sort of doing what they're doing. I tell them peers, and it, they, I get the double take. And that's to me something that's troubled me. It's always, after I became aware of it, annoyed me. So in 2008, a, a guy at the back, actually, Tim Campbell, where is he? He interviewed me for a, a scheme for the government. Um, 
called Reach, and it was basically a role model for young black men and boys. People said to me, yeah, you should be a role model. And I never really, I never understood why I should be a role model until I looked back. I looked at my journey from that Milltown Comprehensive School to Credit Suisse First Boston and being a city lawyer and going into business. And I realized actually that when I look back, and even today to some extent, even with my profile and the things I'm involved in, I never meet me. I never meet in technology, banking, I've run a hedge fund, I've had a corporate finance boutique, I've been a lawyer, investment banker, in technology, technology I call it male, pale, stale. I never meet me, and especially if you narrow it down to people of Caribbean heritage, I never ever meet me. And people had a go at me for saying this, but the only person I met like me in the city was typically two in the morning with a hoover. And that's got to change, and that's something that's bothered me from that time on. So what I decided to do was do something about it. So I was sitting around in 2009, and I thought, right, how do I help? I'm coming on to my pitch now, so get your pens and pencils out. So I thought, how do I help young people who look like me, African, Caribbean, mixed race, or whatever, get into the city with no barriers? It should be a way of just giving them experiences with no barriers. And as time went on, I thought, well, you know what? I'm actually as half working class Mancunian lad, my dad, as I am rowdy West Indian lady, my mum. And I thought, who actually cares what you look like, what religion you are, what your socioeconomic background is, what sexuality you are, whether you've got a tattoo on your face, whether you just, you know, you failed every exam you've ever tried until that day. Who cares? And who cares about the city as well? Most young people I meet have no clue how to become a hairdresser, how to become a nurse. Clueless. Like me, they have no idea apart from their very tight social network, the parents, the uncle, the neighbour, maybe some schoolwork experience, what's out there, what the opportunities are. So how on earth are you expected to plan a career and make informed decisions about your future? And I see this all the time in young people's faces, all the time. I'm a trusted, I work with Plotter, I'm a trustee of Nesta, a very big innovation charity, Powerless Foundation, we're opening a school, uh, a free school, a sixth form college. I see it all the time. I'm actually going to come on to my slides now. If I knew it was this big, I would have spent more time on them. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so what I'm starting is uh, with Sam over here and some partners is workinsight.org. The clue's in the name, it's about work insights. So the point is, is this, is that, you know, I, in my business as well, it's about work experience. Work experience is a great thing. All the research shows that. It shows that if you've got work experience or workplace experience, you're more likely to be employed. It's just all out there. There's no shortage, as I've found on the internet and the government, there's no shortage of it. But the point is, what do you do about it? How do you scale up access to work experience? Schools, colleges, job centres, everybody wants to do it. But employers, and we all know this, employers and schools and colleges, they just do not work. They do not talk. They do not understand how each other thinks. How do you put the two together? So I sat down and thought, and I'll go through the variables. How do you create something to break this down and scale it up? This is what we're creating. So it's about as short as I could get my elevator pitch. It's a digital platform that's connecting young people through their both students and the unemployed, so everybody almost, through their school, their job centre, with employers of all sizes. Very important point. You haven't got to be an enormous name. This can be your local butcher. And that's very important. 90 odd percent of people are employed by SMEs, not large companies with these large programmes. Um, and it's to basically replace, in many ways, not replace work experience, this is a layer down. It's had a new experience called insights. They're short, they're bite-sized, and they and make a massive difference. Again, I spent more time on it. So this is the model, really. So at the bottom, I saw myself as swimming in this pool of talent that a lot of you in here are trying to access. Problem is, at the top, the little triangle, that's actually where the opportunity is, the jobs. And typically, when you look at the people at the top, especially the grad recruitment, apprentice, people in jobs, employment, especially you move up the you know, to sea level suite, diversity is a massive, massive issue. And what's really frustrating, it's actually getting worse. So the point is, how do you connect employers at the top with the talents at the bottom? How do you get the talents at the bottom to experience what it might be like at the top? That's about inspiration. They can then aspire to get into those roles. And once they've aspired, they can then plan a route from A to B. 
So this is the model, really. This is one slide. I've only got one other slide. So the point is, is that, you know, the education system in many ways is preparing people. So, you know, Nestle, a lot of work on creative economy and automation and robots. So a lot of young people are being prepared, working their socks off, studying, doing all sorts of stuff for careers that will be obsolete within 10 years. In my business, we are automating, we're employing other people, but we're automating basic roles out of our business all the time in the cloud infrastructure. I saw a stat the other day, I was at another event, and it was saying that 65% of US school children will work in occupations that don't exist today. In my business, apart from back office and a sort of, um, I better not say HR, I'll get shot down, but back office, like finance especially, in any other part of our business, most of the roles, I think it's 77% we worked out, didn't exist three years ago in our business either. And the problem's this. So if you distill all of this, and I'm going to go through it in a bit of detail quickly before I get a red light, it's about the Uber Taxis app of work experience. That's what we're creating. Demand of work experience is going for the roof. Supply is stagnant. Who gets work experience? It's contacts, networks, it's your friend. You know, I've done it myself, it's easy, it's just the way it happens. Problem is, what you're not doing is actually widening the net. You're still fishing within those social networks that are very, very tight. Demand's going up, supply's stagnant. As an entrepreneur, way to make some money, actually. This is a charity, this is a not-for-profit. That's an opportunity to actually impact, create impact and make effect social change. So we're trying to create supply. How do you create supply? Productize it. Henry T4, it's all very straightforward. Forget two weeks' work experience. Some employee of yours thinking, oh, God, I'm going to do this person now for two weeks, following me around, make my tea, get my dry cleaning. You know, you're the CEO, I may spend half an hour with them. It's a nightmare for most people. The resource, the security. One of the reasons work experience is limited is because it's such a pain to do it in terms of resource commitment. And also, you know, you can get a lot out of, we've done, these, we've done a pilot, and lots of names are actually in the room today have been involved in the pilot, including Change Board. And the pilot's amazing. They're engaging half a day a day. So it's productized, half a day a day. What's an office like? What's the, what's the entrance like? What do you do? What do you wear? How did you get here? How do you all interact? Just show me a case study of what you do. The CEO can pop in for half an hour and go, hello, and tell him his or her story. Then they move on. So it's productize it. How do you put the two together using a digital platform? Digitize it. Use technology. We're all used to it now. We take it for granted. You know, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Uber Taxis app. Use technology to put people together. Automate it. That's how you scale these things up. So we're building a totally automated process to put together young people and employers. This is a digital platform, nothing else. Productize it, digitize it. So the idea is, you come in, you're a young person, job seeker. You may not have no idea what you want to do. So we're working with Plotter, where you go through the psychometric tests, suggest ideas, or you know, you might think, I like, I'm being very general now, I like maths and drawing, oh, try architecture. Employees, employers signed up, saying, look, I'll get involved and provide work insights. And there are lots of motivations why employers might do it. Some are doing it purely because it's philanthropy, very much CSR. Some are doing it, uh, I won't mention the names, probably some in the room, I get the PR police chasing me. Some are doing it because it's about actually recruitment. Small companies are doing it because they're doing it because actually they see a way of meeting local talent and having a conversation with them. And what's been amazing from our paper-based pilot, it's not digital at the moment, is that in, is it, I think it's probably 10% of cases, there's an ongoing interaction with that person. From helping them with the CV to actually getting them in and talking about a job. The other point is with this is you can engage all employers. So you don't have to be a massive name. Your school, my school knows JNR Armrod's making kitchens for 125 years in my town. They know them, there's a relationship, sign them up. You get a network effect. Employers, young people, schools, colleges, they sign each other up, it grows. Employers sign up, they put them on the platform, it connects you. So, for example, Foster and Partners, fantastic experience. I had there for an hour, never mind the young person. They sign up and say, okay, we'll provide work insights. It connects them from all different schools and colleges, one to 10 people for half a day. Tuesday morning, 8.30, turn up at this place. You know who they are, because it's a locked profile. It's all secure. The magic is there is no selection criteria at all. You do not get to choose who turns up to that work insight. They might spend 10 people, might sit there, 
two might hate it, rather eat their own arm than work for your business, but they've learned something. So it's about, on that spectrum of motivation, putting something back, recruitment, training. And what's happened with lots of large firms have come back to us and said, we give our employees volunteer days, actually. We don't know how to manage it. Could this be our employee, employee engagement tool? That's what they've approached us with. And this is an automatic way of actually plugging a software solution to do that. Sustainability as well, I'm getting there. Sustainability, so we've, I've come at this as a business. This could be a business, it's not, it's a charity. But I've designed it with multiple revenue models. Employers, you might think it's counterintuitive, they actually pay to do the insights. We've picked a number for the moment. And you might think, well, why is that? Because actually, when you look at trying to do it yourselves, if you add up the resource commitment and the cost of doing it, it's a lot, lot, lot more than what we're sort of charging. So it's part for service, it's part um, giving something back as well. And it's measurable. The beauty is it's digital. So you as an employer have a dashboard, who's doing what, where, what you've invested, the time, the demographics, charts, the school, college, job centre knows who's doing what, where they are at that point in time, down to maps and mashups and to due diligence, due deal. You've got the middle bit, the young people, the important. They get experience. They're empowered to choose experiences that matter to them. Not just something their teachers got the guy down the pencil manufacturer down the road has got this work experience tick a box. So they're empowered. The idea is you can do lots of them. They're short, they're bite sized. Do PR, do marketing, do advertising. You like PR, do one in consumer PR, do one in financial PR. Think about financial PR as a career option. Go after it. That's the idea. So I'm going to bring it to a close. So really, what we're trying to do here is you know, diversity is a big issue. Connecting talent with opportunity is a big issue. But we can't just sit around pontificating about it forever. You've got to do something about it. I was watching some thing at Davos, people sitting in chairs talking about how they're going to break down the barriers. You know, the people in this room alone with this and work insight and plotter can make an enormous difference to thousands of young people. Um, so I've got a chairman, a guy called Ken Alyssa, who's just been appointed to the uh, Lord Mayor, the Lord Lieutenant of Greater London by the Queen, and I'm always nicking his slogan because he's, he's got a coat of arms. Unfortunately, at my school, I never did Latin, so I can't really read it, but it, it, it kind of read it to me. And I think it's really important that in this room, everyone's doing quite well, you personally or your businesses. And his slogan is, do well, do good. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. It's a great talk. Um, so what is this uh, extent is having a diverse workforce a strategic priority for you? Uh, how are they voting, guys? How are people talking about that? Yeah, it is a strategic priority. So you could be onto something here. It's changing. Um, can we have the questions? Um, what, what question do you guys actually want to ask peers? Uh, what piece of advice have you received over the course of your career that's had the biggest impact on your success? So, I mean, I never really had a lot of advice, actually. Um, I only got advice sort of later on when I was sort of working in, you know, the sort of large banks, large organizations. I never had advice, you know, my parents were very supportive, but they didn't really understand the world I was trying to get into, it was completely new to them. So one of the issues is about having these sort of interactions and workplace experiences, you can, you can actually uh, accumulate advice. Um, I struggled with it, I never had great advice. I can't actually think of instance. Advice, is it, is it, I mean, you talk a lot about internal motivation, there's a lot obviously that, you, that is coming from you, and almost there must have been a kind of voice in your head saying, Piers, you need to do this. You know, it's almost like a. It was sort of pushing on. I never really knew what I was pushing on to. I was just sort of jumping from one, you know, law. But you knew to a banking. direction of travel, right? You didn't know exactly what you were working at, but you knew you had to I, go I had, this way. I had way. momentum. So I always say that, you know, if you're a young person with the right social capital and you're the young person I was saying about, they've got these plans, you might not end up being some strategy consultant because you have no idea, that's all you know about. Well, you've got momentum. I also it's like a bullet. If it's traveling, it's going to go somewhere. Picking something up off the sand and trying to get it going is very, very difficult. It's about momentum, about trajectory. That's what we're trying to do. And I always had that. Um, but I, even today, I say, I don't know what I do. What I, I have no idea what I want to do when I grow up. I just don't. But is that teachable? Or is that, is that something that you can help young people to say, well, actually, I don't know what I want to do, but actually just go and do some stuff. Go yes, and some stuff. I mean, lots of young people, and some are very passionate, and they've got a really clear plan. They've got momentum. Might not end up there, but they've got momentum. But I meet a huge number of young people that have absolutely no clue 
about what to do from where they're sitting. And they're doing, the, they're doing courses and degrees. They don't really know why, because someone advised them to do it. They have no clue. And, and the two things, the biggest issue, which is why I've been doing this, one is experience of what opportunities exist out there and role models. So if you don't see yourself working in large organizations like me, I never saw myself, but I just kind of got on with it. If you don't see yourself, are you going to aspire to work in that kind of role? Yeah, okay. Um, any quick questions for peers? Any burning questions that you would like to ask him? No? Okay, all right, Piers, thank you Pleasure. so much. Really thank appreciate you. that. Thanks.